um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Donatello Elia. I'm a junior scientist at the Advanced Scientific Computing Division at the uh, CMCC Foundation, which is located in Lecce in Italy. And I'm also a PhD student at the University of Salento, uh, which is still also uh, lo located in, uh, in Lecce. Uh, my activities are in the field of computer science and in particular in data uh, analysis. Uh, in the second part of the session of high performance data analytics and visualization, I'm going to focus more on the uh, data ana analytics uh, aspect after uh, the session of Nikas, which were more re re related uh, on uh, visualization. Uh, the lab uh, video tutorial uh, that will be, uh, uh, which is scheduled after this session, uh, although it's centered more on practical aspects, is uh, strongly related to this, uh, to this session. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the session, as, uh, as uh, usual, you can simply tap them on the chat. I'll try to go through them at the end of um, blocks of, of, of slides and I'll also um, keep some time at the end of the presentation uh, in order to um, um, pick some questions or to check those which were not uh, addressed during the, the presentation. So this is the outline of the, of the talk. Uh, I'll first provide a brief introduction to big data. Um, and also the convergence of high performance computing and data analytics, and uh, also introduce uh, high performance data analytics and some of the main challenges uh, in e, e science and in particular in the field of, of climate change uh, concerning data, data management and uh, analysis. Uh, then introduce the ECOS service that uh, was set up in the scope of the European Open Science Cloud initiative. And we'll have a, a close look to uh, on high performance data analytics framework, which is called of Ophidia, uh, which is also one of the core components of ECAS, and how it addresses the, the data challenges. Mm, I'll then move uh, to an application um, level, um, to more application level features of the Ophidia framework, which concern data ana analytics workflows, and uh, moving finally then to the Py Ophidia interface, which is the Ophidia Python bindings. So uh, big data emerged uh, during the, the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, one way of, uh, for, uh, for defining the properties of, of big data is uh, by using the well-known 3D model, uh, which includes uh, volume, uh, velocity, and, uh, and, uh, and variety. Um, I assume some of you are, might uh, heard uh, about this, this, uh, this, this model. It was uh, defined in uh, two, 2001 by, by Doug, uh, Doug Lenny, uh, an analyst at Meta Group, uh, which is now part of, of Garner. Uh, and it was a, a reference in this, in this report, with, uh, which uh, is a reference at the, at the bottom of, uh, of, of this slide. Uh, this paper basically describes uh, the challenges which are uh, re related to the increase in volume and velocity and a variety of, uh, of, of data. Uh, this model was not uh, initially used for uh, the, mm, let's say, to the define big data, uh, but then has been increasingly uh, been adopted by the co community and also by some uh, enterprises uh, in, the, in the following years. Now the model has been uh, extended, including also additional deals such as uh, value and, uh, and uh, the Veracity, but in uh, in this regard, you can find even more, uh, like seven or 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 sometimes even even more than that. So um, starting from the from the volume, uh, this may be the the more obvious of the of the three D of the three and, and concern the the scale of, uh, of of data, basically the the data size, uh, which introduces of course uh, issues in terms of uh, of storage. And uh, and uh, and access to the data as we saw in the uh, previous session of the summer school, and also uh, on the uh, 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 part of the uh, analysis. So there has been an increase in data volumes in several uh, domains, which are now in the in the scale of terabytes uh, up to up to petabytes, and they're continuing to increase uh, year after year. Velocity uh, instead refers to the to the timeliness of the of the of the data, both in terms of collection and uh, analysis. 
So it does not only uh, consider the speed at which data is uh, being pro produced. Uh, so for example, data from, uh, from sensor or, or social media, which are basically a continuous stream of information. But it also takes into consideration the speed at which the data moves into the, into the system uh, for storage and uh, uh, data analytics. Uh, so in order to maximize uh, the value that, this, uh, that, is, that can be extracted from, from, from this data, uh, it's important that the analysis must be uh, conducted rapidly. So from this point of view, according uh, uh, to when we get the results of the uh, analysis, once the data is, uh, uh, once the data arrives to, to, to the system, and it can be uh, classified as uh, as a real time uh, which is uh, which is performed in a, in a very short short time range um, usually in a, uh, in a, in a few seconds uh, but in principle uh, immediately after the data arrives into the system uh, then uh, near re real time is uh, instead uh, analysis which uh, is is, is uh, performed still in a very short time uh, but uh, not as fast as in uh, in uh, real time. In this case, um, some minutes are uh, acceptable uh, acceptable for the uh, analysis. And then, of course, the analysis can also be performed in uh, in batch, uh, and this can be done when, let's say, more more time is is uh, is needed. Can be um, also uh, can also take several hours and up to up to days. And this is typically performed, let's say, offline after the data has been uh, acquired. The third V is a uh, variety, which represents the uh, heterogeneity in the, in, the, in the data. In fact, in the case of big data, this, um, the data can come from very different sources and can have very different formats. Uh, for example, um, structured data, uh, you can think of as this as uh, like tables that we can find like in spreadsheets or or uh, databases or in uh, in uh, machine logs and also on netcdf files are in sort of way um, sort of structured data then on the opposite side there's the unstructured data uh, which is very common and actually most of the of the data which is uh, pro produced nowadays basically unstructured data and this can be for example uh, all multimedia files like images, videos, uh, also audio files and uh, documents and, uh, and, uh, and web page. Then there's a semi-structured data which lies uh, in, the, in, the, in the middle of, the, of, of these two uh, types. And this is um, sort of documents which have tags like in JSON or XML documents, but don't have a very, a very rigid structure. Concerning the other uh, Vs, for example, the veracity uh, basically re refers to data quality. Uh, it means the ac accuracy of, of, uh, of, of data, for example, if there are missing values, but also the reliability of the, of the data source and, uh, and the security of um, that, this, uh, uh, that the content of, of, of the data may, uh, may, may carry. Uh, the value instead is the intrinsic significance that uh, can be extracted from this data to create benefits and, uh, and, and to create the business for the uh, organization. All these characteristics um, pose a challenge that must be addressed in order to properly uh, manage, store, and analyze uh, big data. So the data re requires software solutions which are able to scale and handle uh, the data in, uh, in, the, in parallel in order to fully uh, exploit its, uh, its value. We'll see more in detail later in the presentation some challenges which are more related to climate, to climate data. Uh, if you're interested in, uh, in more in big data, I've added a set of, of reference at the, at, the, at the end of this, of this presentation with uh, some readings uh, that might be interesting. Uh, so data, um, is uh, being uh, produced by many different fields. Um, uh, for example, from, from web searches, from uh, applications, uh, from mobile de de devices, from social media, uh, from sensor, and also from, uh, from 
enterprises, and of course also from the from the uh, scientific field, which is now producing uh, producing massive amounts of of data, for example, from simulation, from uh, observation and uh, experiments. Uh, this applies to several scientific domain, like the high energy physics, or also in astronomy, and uh, of course also in uh, atmospheric science, which is uh, more the topic of this uh, of this session. Uh, here we can see an example of the evolution of the data size in the field of uh, climate data. This picture from Dean Williams provides a perspective of data increase across the various stages of the climate model interconference. Uh, which is a collaborative framework uh, to which mm, the main climate research centers worldwide contribute uh, in, uh, in order to better un understand climate change. And uh, here we can see that um, through the various phases there has been uh, an increase, uh, a, a steady increase in the in the in the data side. So uh, the last uh, uh, completed uh, stage of the of the SMIP. Uh, uh, Experiment was a SMIP-5, which, which produced around 3.5 terabytes of, uh, of, of data. And uh, while, while the current one is uh, sixth, uh, the sixth stage, uh, SMIP-6, which is expected to produce 10 times more climate data uh, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, simulation. This would be between, uh, expected to be between 20 and 40, 40 petabytes. So these big data that need uh, uh, to be accessed and uh, analyzed to study the effects of, of climate change and of course managing, archiving and uh, ana analyzing these big quantities can be, can be very, very challenging. Uh, big data is um, uh, a relatively new, new field and uh, to address it, uh, a wide set uh, of uh, software solution have, have been developed in the, in the last year. Uh, there has been an impressive effort in uh, implementing Tools for basically uh, managing all uh, all the parts of the of the data life life cycle. Uh, in the field of uh, open source software solutions, a very um, famous eg example of uh, big data systems is uh, the uh, uh, comes from the uh, Apache Hadoop software stack, which includes a wide set of systems capable of managing. Uh, uh, all the all the aspects concerning data, for example, uh, storage, uh, accessing data, also job uh, job scheduling and uh, and uh, analytics. Um, some some examples are, for example, the uh, HDFS system, which manage uh, basically storage, uh, or the Hadoop Map Reuse, and also Apache Spark is a very is a very uh, well known system. Now, if you look at the big data. Uh, Analytics ecosystem compared this with the HPC ecosystem, we can observe that these mm, two are quite different from several point of views. Uh, although they share uh, the goal of supporting parallel uh, computing, these slides try to uh, provide a comparison of the two en environments, uh, providing a generalization of the aspect which are typically associated to the two ecosystems. Um, so here we can see that uh, big data mainly exploits. Uh, commodity hardware, uh, which are um, typically uh, uh, which are typically uh, cheaper with with, with respect to uh, HPC uh, clusters, and these are composed of several FAD nodes. Uh, we have a small a smaller number of of, of cores with uh, re respect to the nodes uh, typically used in HPC cluster, and have a, a large amount of memory and exploit uh, uh, Ethernet connection. And this is the type of cluster which is exploited in uh, in, uh, in cloud computing. Um, on the other end, we, uh, as we saw also in other other presentations, uh, the HPC clusters are are composed of of many nodes uh, with reduced fast uh, interconnection and very sophisticated and non non trivial uh, architecture, which includes uh, beside the the CPUs also GPUs and uh, and uh, F, F, FPGAs. Uh, in high, in high performance computing clusters, uh, the computing and data infrastructures are typically separated uh, using a shared disk approach for the, for the storage uh, cluster, uh, which are based on parallel file and file systems. Yet, as we saw yesterday, new solutions for storage and file systems are uh, 
emerging, but this is, uh, let's say, the typical uh, scenario in, uh, in uh, many clusters. Uh, on the other hand, the data analytics ecosystem instead relies on a sure nothing uh, architecture to reduce data movement uh, from the data uh, uh, nodes to the computing uh, nodes. So basically, the data uh, is stored locally on the on the same node that you're using uh, for uh, for performing the the computation. And this is what happens, for example, with the uh, uh, Hadoop, di Hadoop distributed file uh, file system. Uh, also, job job scheduler uh, at fair uh, as this has been designed uh, for the most common workflows in the in the two in the two ecosystems. So HPC uh, workloads are mainly composed by large uh, parallel uh, MPI based uh, batch applications such as simulation, which use a a large number of uh, of of cores with fixed uh, re requirements. And that don't usually change during the execution. And these schedulers are, in, in a way, uh, a monolithic and and, uh, and centralized. And uh, being centralized has the advantage of, the advantage that they provide optimal re re resource uh, allocation. Uh, data intensive workloads, uh, on on the other uh, hand, can be composed of multiple uh, heterogeneous tasks. Uh, both including short and um, and uh, long running jobs, and then the, the scheduling re re requirements are uh, are also different. So scheduling is performed uh, more on task basis rather than on on job basis, and this allows improving the resource uh, utilization, and uh, and it can also allow uh, for a dynamic resource uh, allocation uh, throughout the application execution. Um, then there's also a big difference in terms of uh, programming models and uh, and the languages used. So in the case of high, high, high performance computing, uh, these are typically implemented by exploiting MPI plus OpenMP for uh, for prioritization. Whereas in the case of uh, big data systems, these these use different parallel paradigms such as the map map re reduce paradigm. And also in terms of programming languages, there's a big difference uh, because um, Many um, application in uh, in uh, in the field of uh, high performance computing in institutional uh, computing basically are based on C and uh, and uh, and Fortran, whereas uh, in the field of uh, big data, higher level languages such as Java and uh, and Python are are uh, are more used. Uh, so, but of, of course, there's this big difference, and uh, it's important to note that the, also the type of uh, uh, application which is run in the ecosystem is uh, is uh, quite different. Here in this slide we can see uh, a figure from this very interesting picture from this very interesting uh, paper, sorry, uh, which which portrays the difference in the two uh, ecosystem from the application level, of concern in the um, uh, programming languages and the various abstraction, and uh, on the on the middleware system which include uh, scheduling, file system. And also at the at the system uh, at the software system level and at the hardware level, mm. concerning different types of networks and uh, and uh, and computing hardware. Besides this, also the soft. Uh, besides this, uh, let's say also the workload is uh, is is different. Uh, um, so these two ecosystems are clearly not uh, uh, not convergent. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, the development of data analytics ecosystem has been very rapid and occurred mainly during the last 15, 20 years. And in most cases, also outside the scientific uh, computing uh, co community, whereas uh, uh, scientific computing uh, like simulation and models builds on decades of experience in using uh, parallel computing and high performance uh, computing hardware and uh, architecture. So uh, the mm, the development in the two fields have been mainly independent, leading to a certain divergence, uh, as we saw in the previous slides, in the two ecosystems. But uh, now, in the last couple of years, the two communities are looking with increasing interest at the convergence of the solution and, and technologies. And this will allow, from one side, the analytics to exploit high performance computing infrastructures and techniques. Uh, well, it, it will empower uh, scientists and engineers with new tools from data analytics to extract knowledge from a huge uh, um, amounts of, of data in a very efficient way. 
And this is important because uh, both high performance computing and data intensive analytics are considered fundamental aspects for advanced scientific discoveries. Uh, so addressing the challenges related to this conversion, conversion would be a key point for supporting scientific discovery. Uh, and this led to uh, uh, the high performance data ana ana analytics definition, which is a relatively uh, recent field uh, where high performance computing techniques and big data analytics are joined together in order to further accelerate and scale uh, the analysis. I'll now move to uh, more um, uh, to challenges which are more related to the field of data. Uh, in climate science, uh, is uh, it's critically dependent on the availability of uh, reliable infrastructure uh, for accessing large quantities of uh, data. Um, the Earth System Grid Federation, which is uh, shown in this slide, is a coordinated multi uh, agency international collaboration, uh, which aims at developing and maintaining uh, software infrastructure for supporting uh, global cl climate uh, change research. So it integrates a set of components for data publishing, searching, uh, as well as user interface and security management. Uh, this has been used uh, for multiple earth, earth science projects uh, and spread access to petabytes of data from simulation observational and real data. Uh, for example, it provides access to the most cloud output, and it's also supporting the SNP6 activity, which will be, which uh, that, that will be available on the on the on the ESGF Federation. Uh, so it employs uh, a distributed and federated architecture in which there are multiple uh, nodes uh, distributed and uh, independent independent managed by the various institutions. Uh, institutions come from all, all over the, the world, as it can be seen in this slide, from the US, uh, China, Japan, and uh, Australia. Uh, Australia. So as I said, in uh, climate science, massive data sets are um, handled. And so several uh, key challenges must be addressed to support large scale analysis. I'll point, I'll point uh, some of these challenges uh, uh, out in this, in, on, on this slide. Uh, let's say non-trivial uh, climate analysis require uh, multi require multi uh, input data, possibly also from, from different models, which makes uh, it even more and more challenging. Uh, to date, this requires uh, downloading uh, the necessary data, for example, from the ESGF uh, uh, infrastructure to the local uh, uh, re, re resources and this uh, with the gigabytes and terabytes of, of data could represent a big a big barrier for uh, for science due to the, the, the network's uh, delay uh, but if we think of of of, of petabyte size data set this is of, of course is simply not not feasible uh, also um, uh, complex climate analysis require frameworks uh, and computing resource cable for supporting end-to-end -end workflow solutions. Analysis may be, in fact, composed of, of multiple uh, uh, set, of, set of tasks, up to hundreds or thousands of, uh, of uh, uh, data ana analytics tasks, which may include also, uh, which may use also different tools and, uh, and, uh, and, and libraries. Uh, and this analysis tool should also be able to scale with the data set sizes and able to support and parallel solution. This type of complex uh, analysis also poses uh, strong requirements in terms of uh, computing and storage re resources. Uh, so new approaches are needed to address the challenges and support climate analysis at scale. Uh, to effectively support um, high performance data management and an analytics, uh, dedicated data intensive computing facilities which are close to uh, uh, the storage system, uh, jointly with scalable data uh, access abstractions are required. To design uh, server-side approaches um, will help to uh, drastically re re reduce data, data movement. In fact, uh, the computation will be moved from the client-side tools uh, close to the, to the data centers where the re resources are uh, available, well, the resources and also the data uh, is available. 
And uh, in this way, Sinus will be able to perform the uh, analysis without uh, needing to, to download much, much data or to install much, much software. Uh, so that we just need to download the final uh, result of the analysis, which is typically in the, in the range of, uh, of few kilobytes up to, up to some, some megabytes. Let's say this, this typically. So server side approaches allow also uh, uh, for the creation of, of collaborative environments. Uh, we will see uh, an example in one of the next slides. Uh, so in this case, there is no need to set up tools and, and libraries and uh, source scientists can just use the environment uh, the, the way it has been set up. And this allows also uh, for uh, code sharing and, uh, and the use of the experiment. And so this will uh, relieve the end user from installing tools locally and uh, and uh, and along the, the the data. Moreover, uh, higher level programming approaches are uh, are also needed uh, because uh, uh, this because uh, as the as the size of of data and the complexity of the infrastructure increase, it is important to provide some set of uh, abstraction that can. Uh, Hide all this this complexity and, uh, and and support the the user when they find the analysis. This will allow to improve uh, a lot the the, the productivity. But um, from the other end, we also uh, this will also need uh, a, a cultural uh, change uh, because a new uh, pro programming process should should be then uh, uh, adopted. Uh, finally, uh, as I mentioned also in the previous slide, workflow support is also a key, uh, a key aspect uh, to allow complex and saleable data intensive uh, analysis composed of hundreds of analytical tasks. So I'm going to introduce the, um, the ECAS uh, service, uh, which is the uh, ENES Climate An Analytics Service, which has been uh, set up in the scope of the EOSCAB uh, project. Uh, which is one of the project uh, in, the, in the frame of the European Open Science Cloud e Initiative. So I'll now give a brief introduction to the uh, European Open, Open Science Cloud, uh, which is an ambitious program from uh, the European Union that will offer a virtual environment uh, with open and seamless services for storage management and analysis. And uh, this will also allow reuse of uh, research data uh, across borders and, uh, and disciplines. Uh, this program aims to deliver an uh, open data science environment by federating existing uh, scientific data infrastructure, offering to European scientists and practitioners uh, seamless access to data and interoperable services, allowing also for uh, reuse of research data, which is presently restricted um, by geographic borders. USCAP is one of the projects uh, targeting the U European Open Science Cloud and is a key infrastructure project in the EOS landscape. Oh. Okay, EGAS, which is the um, NS Climate Analytics Service, is one of the, um, sorry, okay, I see a question. Um, just handle this, okay. It's one of the thematic service supported and offered to users by um, the EOSCAP project. EOSCAP contri uh, contributes uh, to the European Open Science Cloud by uh, bringing together multiple services providers and softwares from the EGI Federation, uh, also from UDA CDI and from Indigo Data Cloud and other major re research infrastructure to create the hub, which will represent a single entry point for European researchers and, uh, and stakeholders uh, with the goal to deliver access to a um, wide catalog of services and software at the European level. Uh, ECAS, which has been set up by CNCC and DRZ, provides a workflow-based parallel and server-side data analysis environment, uh, which allows to support uh, experiment on large volumes of scientific data. Uh, ECAS is based on multiple components, which are centered around the Ophidia High Performance Data Analytics Framework, uh, which I'll um, present later, and integrates uh, this with data and uh, with, with this with data and also with the uh, recording uh, re, re resources. Uh, the Ophidia uh, framework uh, is integrated with uh, other uh, sharing services, access data access and sharing services, uh, like uh, UDAT, B2Drop, uh, or B2Share, or OneData, along also with uh, EGI uh, 
uh, service like the federated cloud in the inf infrastructure and other security services. And the services uh, provide, uh, said, not only the tools for the analysis, but which is also uh, important, also provide access to scientific data sets and to computing re resources targeting both cloud and high performance computing infrastructure. Upon ECAS, um, the ECAS lab, uh, which is a user-friendly Python-based environment uh, for data analysis as, uh, as, uh, as has been set, set up. Um, besides ECAS, it also um, integrates a Jupyter service uh, jointly with a wide set of well-known scientific Python modules for analysis and visualization, uh, including, for example, uh, Matplotlib, BaseMap, Car2Py, NumPy, and others. Thanks to the Jupyter Hub, uh, which is um, basically a multi-user interface for Jupyter notebooks, it is possible to exploit uh, very easily uh, the ECAS features together with the Python ecosystem from the, from the notebooks. To support scientists and allow them to get started with environments, uh, we also provided some training and demonstration notebook, uh, which can be accessed from the, from the uh, instances. CMCC and DigerZ currently host the two major uh, ECAS lab instances uh, with some ready to use multi node uh, ECAS deployment. Here you can see the links to the, to, the, to the services. If you are interested in getting access to the platform, you can register for free uh, to get an account. And once you, you log in, you'll find some notebooks and, and data to test the environment. So ECAS Lab uh, aims to provide a complete environment for supporting uh, the climate science activities and provide a single entry point uh, for service side data analysis. And so as I said, it provides also computing resources and data pools, for example, uh, some data from the SGF data archive. By exploiting this environment, scientists can perform their analysis without the need to download any data or, or set up any, any tool for accessing the environment. They basically need just a web, a web browser. EGAS allows also the execution of a complex workflow, besides, let's say, interactive exploratory analysis, which can be performed through the Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, in the slide, you can, you can see an example of the, of the graph of, the, of a multi-modal climate uh, analysis workflow. We'll see an example of this specific workflow and uh, in the final slide of this, this presentation. And a final word about the uh, environment. CMCC ECAS Lab instance is also one of the compute, computing services uh, made available by the European project Business Tree for virtual access and through the international access calls. So next slide, I'll introduce um, one of the core components of ECAS service, which is the Ophidia Performance Data Analytics Framework. Uh, Ophidia is, um, is a CMCC project uh, which aims to uh, address uh, scientific data challenges targeting data intensive uh, analysis on multidimensional data and is primarily exploited in the, in the climate change domain. Uh, it provides a high performance analytics solution by joining aspects from uh, high performance computing and big data um, paradigms. It implements a server side approach for running parallel IO uh, and uh, analytics, and also propose an internal um, array-based and distributed storage model to manage large amounts of multidimensional scientific data, leveraging the uh, data cube abstraction. And it also provides end-to-end uh, -end mechanisms to run complex experiments and large processing workflows. We'll go through the um, details of these points in the, in the following slides. Uh, before, I just wanted to give uh, an overview of the data challenges uh, addressed by uh, Ophidia. Um, so, um, at the time when we initially designed the uh, Ophidia framework, uh, the, typically, uh, the typical workflow followed by scientists, uh, which in, in part still applies today, was based on a search, locate, and download, and uh, analysis step. So as we can see in this, this figure, after the scientist downloaded the data set from remote data servers, such as the ESGF, they relied on domain specific, um, uh, which were often based, uh, often desktop based tools uh, to perform the uh, analysis. Uh, of course, um, this approach wasn't uh, uh, very scalable. So Ophelia proposed a shift in this paradigm. 
uh, by moving the processing on the server side like close to the high performance um, cluster and the uh, and, uh, data center, providing also a parallel framework for running uh, the analysis in parallel, requiring just lightweight client side tools. This allow to reduce the download time and at the same time also take advantage of the resource available on the data center to run the uh, computation. So besides these key aspects in uh, the design, um, Ophelia also took into consideration several uh, other requirements from a more an application standpoint. And so for example, the support for uh, time series processing, for data subsetting, for multimodal inter comparison, uh, for high throughput computing, and also for metadata management, such as uh, data provenance. Other more technical uh, requirements uh, include a storage model for, for n-dimensional data, a data distribution techniques to enable the parallelism, and we'll see this in, uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, the FIDA framework also tries um, uh, to provide an extensible uh, API in order to uh, add additional function to the, to the framework in, a, in, a, in an easy manner. So basically, the framework tries uh, to address uh, the, um, the, the data challenges in, uh, in, uh, in scientific uh, domains by providing a full software stack. Uh, this slide shows an overview of one of the uh, key points proposed by Ophelia, which is the shift of the processing from the client side to the server side. Users can submit their commands from uh, the local environment to the server side. Uh, this could be uh, re reside on a high performance computing on cloud cluster, uh, where the computing components of Ophelia uh, have to be set up. And uh, the execution can be triggered by uh, the Ophelia terminal, which is a shell-like uh, command line interface, or by using a more programmatic interface with, with Python, by using the Ophelia Python bindings. The client-side uh, reverse are then handled by the Ophelia server, which manage the execution of the operations on the computing resources and interact with the high performance computing scheduler. Uh, this allows uh, moving the processing towards the data center and requires the user minimal effort, uh, allowing uh, uh, to improve uh, greatly uh, the, the productivity. So uh, the framework has been designed uh, for multidimensional data, and hence it is flexible enough to be used in multiple scientific uh, do domains. In fact, uh, be uh, always focused on the climate uh, domain application. It has been successfully used also uh, in uh, biodiversity analysis in uh, fire pre prevention, uh, for uh, seismology uh, analysis, and also for traffic data in the context of, uh, of, the, of, of smart cities. Uh, in fact, Ophelia has been exploited uh, and involved in several European projects. This slide shows just some of, the, uh, of, of these projects, um, such as EasyWays uh, 2, which is, is providing summer school, and EasyMistry and, and EOSCAB that I mentioned also. Uh, in the previous slide. So I'll now move uh, to the um, details of the Ophidia framework. Uh, just check into the chat if there are any questions. I saw um, the icon uh, linking, so okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay, I'm quite lost. So, will a, a EOSC, in the chat, is, will EOSC be available to the open public, including companies for climate service developers? Uh, okay, yes. Uh, Junior answered with the uh, yes. The the in the case of uh, of uh, EGAS lab, this is accessible uh, to uh, let's say uh, to scientists if they want to um, access the the service. It's it's. it's uh, it's free uh, of use for uh, for uh, research. Okay, and another answer will. Uh, there was a reply. So I'll um, continue with the presentation. So this is the um, high level diagram showing the FIDIA architecture, uh, which is very modular and composed by various components of different layers. It has been defined in order to be uh, scalable. Uh, so that new nodes could be uh, easily uh, added 
at, at, at different levels. The top layer is the Ophidia server, which is the front end of the system. Then the second layer consists of the uh, uh, Ophidia analytics framework, which can run on multiple nodes. The third layer uh, consists of multiple IO analytics server, which can also run on multiple nodes. Uh, the data in the data cubes can be partitioned in multiple fragments and is distributed over the data store. Each IO analytics server uh, will handle a set of, a set of fragments. Um, I'll go through the various uh, layers um, using a bottom strategy. So we'll start from the uh, data model, which is the low layer. Uh, this comprises the re re resources to manage a data store. Uh, data in the case of is partitioned in a hierarchical fashion and distributed over the storage layer. Uh, scalable storage model has been defined for managing multidimensional scientific data through the data group abstraction. Uh, the store hardware may be located on the I.O. nodes, as in the case of the memory engine, or also uh, on the local disk on this node, but may also reside on dedicated storage devices and managed, for example, to a shared file, file system. The FIDIA that native I.O. I.O. server has been designed to integrate with heterogeneous storage uh, backends, as we can see in the, in the slide. Um, then the FDDB is the system catalog, uh, which uh, basically keeps uh, track of the partitioning and distribution of the data cubes and also of the, of the metadata. So the FIDIA storage model uh, implements a set of data cube uh, up, um, abstraction from, uh, from all up uh, systems. It is a um, um, two-step two based uh, evolution of the uh, uh, star, star schema. Uh, for those who are not uh, familiar with uh, uh, the star schema from data warehouse, uh, uh, this basically is a logical data model, uh, similar to the relation, re relational model used for, for, for databases. Uh, it consists, uh, basically consists of a single table uh, for the numerical values, which can be associated to the variable, and a set of tables, one for each dimension. Uh, data is represented according to the um, so-called implicit and explicit dimension. The first step of the ev evolution of, if, of the schema introduced the support for uh, array-based data through the implicit di dimension, while uh, the second step uh, maps uh, the remaining uh, dimensions called explicit to a single key. The resulting storage model is then implemented, uh, is then independent. Uh, of the number of dimensions. And so uh, it, it is, is a cable of, uh, of uh, handling, um, uh, um, let's say, a uh, dynamic number of, uh, of the dimension. We have to set this up to five, six dimension. Um, this slide provides a graphic representation of the Ophelia storage model and the two-step evolution just described. So as I said, we start from the um, net, net CDF file, which is mapped uh, to a data cube and represented using the uh, roll-up implementation of the, of the star scheme. So we can think as this as a table will, with n plus one columns, where the first n are, uh, columns are related to the dimension, where the last one is re related to the, to the variable values. In the first step, multiple rows are merged into a, a single binary array according to one or more dimensions, uh, which are called uh, implicit data dimension. And in this case, the array contains the variable, uh, the, the values of the variable, uh, which is related to all the possible configuration of this uh, n uh, minus n data dimension. The measured values are uh, implicitly associated to this dimension based on their uh, position in, in the array, and this is the reason why these are called implicit. A typical example of implicit dimension is the time di di dimension, and the, and the array created will be uh, um, a time series. The second step of this uh, 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 evolution um, um, concerns the mapping of the remaining n di dimensions uh, into uh, a, a single key uh, attribute. Uh, so the resulting table will just have two columns the unique uh, e identifier which associates all the explicit di dimensions to the 
uh, re -re uh, related uh, array and then the binary array. At this point, uh, we can think as, as this as a very long table with all the data cube uh, uh, values. Ophidia uh, horizontally partitioned this into uh, multiple fragments and distributes them over the uh, IO and ana uh, analytic server uh, in exploiting a, a hierarchical approach. Here we can see an example of how a uh, NetCDF uh, data um, file is, uh, is mapped to a, to a data cube. So basically, an all of data cube can be um, uh, thought as composed of, of, uh, of a measure, which are the values uh, re represented in the, in the cube, and then uh, a set of di dimensions that can be used uh, to analyze this, uh, this uh, data cube. Being synthetic data are often multidimensional, uh, it should not be surprising that the data cube abstraction fits uh, fits quite quite uh, quite uh, naturally for this type of data. Uh, in the example, we see uh, uh, that we have the, um, this uh, this variable co corresponds to the temperature uh, variable stored in the NetCD file, whereas the, whereas the dimensions are the latitude, longitude, and time. To ease the understanding, the values uh, represented here are, are not. Uh, actual tem temperature values, but are uh, the indexes uh, with, with respect to the, uh, the dimension. So this, uh, this uh, value here on the lower left, left part, the one co corresponding to the first uh, latitude and, uh, and, uh, and, and longitude uh, uh, and time uh, combination. Uh, so as you can see, the, there are uh, different slices. We can think of this as, as every, every slice is a full uh, latitude longitude grid, and then we have different time, time steps, which is the way you typically uh, find the data is, is stored into, into files. In this slide, we see how uh, mm, the data from an HDF file is uh, mapped in the uh, Ophidia data model. So in this case, uh, we have the, still the same NetCDF file uh, we are uh, organizing this, this uh, data according to the time di dimension, which will be uh, chosen as an implicit di dimension. And, uh, and so we can see that the, the data is uh, organized continuously in uh, uh, arrays uh, in order to make the uh, an analysis more e efficient. Then uh, the latitude and longitude dimension uh, mm, are considered the explicit dimensions and are used to, re uh, to reference the various uh, uh, arrays. So a binary arrays uh, correspond to each combination of explicit dimension values. The representation shown in the slide is just for uh, explanation purposes, uh, because as in the case of all of India, these two columns are actually replaced by a single column as we can see in the next slide. So basically what we have is a two column table with uh, the uh, identifiers and the uh, binary arrays. The, uh, the, the actual values in the, in the, in the table are, are then, are then uh, stored according to the dimension order. In this case, uh, since we have chosen the implicit dimension to be the time di dimension, uh, the data has to be uh, re, uh, re organized during the, the, the input stage. So, uh, Ophelia provides also the features to uh, dynamically reorganize the data lay layout when loading data from, uh, from NetCDF file. Uh, in this case, we're, we are organizing this according to the time dimension. So, uh, the values of this, uh, uh, so the first uh, value in each of these uh, blocks of data will be uh, placed. Uh, uh, continuously on the on the same uh, array. Uh, after we have created the, the full table, then this is uh, split in uh, in multiple fragments according to the to the to the user uh, to the user arguments, and th these are uh, then managed by different I/O and uh, analytics servers. Uh, from a user perspective, the data gives appear as a single immutable object. Uh, abstracting from the underlying partitioning and distribution. Ophid implements also a virtual cube space uh, similar to a file system so that data cubes mm, can be organized in, uh, in the folders 
and it provides also a set of uh, features uh, for managing uh, the user cube space. For example, for listing the cubes, deleting them, moving them uh, in different folders, and and also to search uh, for these based on uh, on metadata values. Uh, the framework provides also features to uh, manage uh, data cube provenance by linking each cube um, to the one from it uh, from which it has uh, originated from. Uh, then the next layer is the I.O. and uh, analytics server level, which includes multiple I.O. analytics nodes, which can run on one or more uh, servers. Each of these servers manage a subset of the, of the data fragment. Uh, and currently, uh, we support a native I.O. and uh, analytics server, as well as a MySQL-based uh, uh, R R DBMS version. Uh, this is called I.O. analytics server uh, because uh, besides analyzing the data and and uh, parsing the, the queries from the from the user, it also takes care of loading and storing data from uh, the files into the into the fragment. The native server provides an in-memory array-based engine, which is optimized to work on multidimensional data directly in memory, and provides also a wide set of uh, array-based primitives for data and analytics, which are also available for the MySQL version. This, in fact, have been implemented as a user-defined function so that they could be easily uh, plugged in. Uh, currently, uh, we have around 100 primitives that perform uh, different types of operations. Um, this include, uh, for example, mathematical operations, statistical operations, also uh, ag aggregation functions. Uh, the full list of primitives can be found on the official uh, documentation uh, at, at the link of the bottom of this slide. Uh, the primitives can be also uh, nested together in the same query in order to build more complex e expression. Uh, all primitives also, um, the next one can be run with the OPH apply operator, which is shown in the lower part of this, of this slide. We now see some examples of the, of the primitives. So this is the OPH map, uh, which, is, uh, which provides a wide set of uh, mathematical operations that can be applied on, uh, on the binary uh, array. Uh, this um, um, ex exploit a SQL-like interface so that we can specify the data type and then the type of function that we want to uh, apply from the from the table uh, shown in the, in the slide. In this slide, uh, we see um, um, an example of uh, of nested primitive. Here we are applying uh, the subarray over the uncompressed data, and then uh, uh, after we subset the data, we apply the the block uh, the box plot uh, function to get the five. Uh, indexes to build the, the, the box plot, all with a single line in an uh, atomic uh, fashion. The nested query is applied on each line of the input fragments, extracting as a subset of the uncompressed data and then computing the box plot values that we can see in the lower part of this slide. There's also um, the uh, option for uh, aggregating data on, uh, on uh, different uh, Arrays, so that means on multiple lines of the of the fragments. Here we can see the OPH aggregate primitive, uh, which performs uh, an aggregation uh, over the elements in the same position located on uh, on uh, different uh, uh, binary uh, arrays. And we can see uh, in the lower part of the slide that the input uh, uh, time series we are have been just uh, Aggregate the computing the, the 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 average of this. Then the second layer of the architecture uh, consists of the of either framework, which can also run on multiple nodes. This provides an environment for the execution of parallel uh, based operators to support parallelism uh, on the fragments. The operators are implemented with a hybrid model based on MPI and uh, and POSIX threads. Uh, POSIX threads have been cho chosen in place of other solutions like OpenMP since uh, it provides a lower uh, level API and thus a uh, finer control of the, of the, of the task. Uh, this operation, in fact, uh, includes uh, some, some coordination steps uh, from the framework to the IO, IO servers. Uh, the framework runs the operators, which uh, work on the whole data group regardless of the structure and the, and the partitioning. We implemented up to 50 
operators for uh, uh, both data and, uh, and uh, metadata processing. Here we see a list of some of those uh, available. Uh, all the data of operators don't, that work on, on, uh, on data cubes uh, have been implemented in a, in a parallel fashion, whereas um, those working on a file system or on uh, metadata are mainly sequential. Operators can be specified with uh, this key value format. So after specifying the operator name, which is this first part, we can specify the set of uh, arguments by using this uh, uh, key, key value format, basically, which we have uh, uh, arguments with, uh, with, uh, with a defined uh, value. Uh, the operators share a set of, uh, of arguments, but of course, each uh, operator has its own specific arguments. Uh, the slide shows some of those which are um, basically shared among all the operators, which allow, for example, as in the case of the XML mode, to run the operators in a blocking or non-blocking fashion, or a number of cores and number of threads allows to specify the parallelism that we want for the operation, whereas cube is uh, the input data cube that can be uh, used for the uh, uh, operation. This slide shows an example of the operators uh, in, uh, in practice. Here we can see in this uh, left, left upper part of the slide that we can run the uh, data re re reduction, which means to aggregate all the uh, binary arrays to have arrays of a single element, or also the ag aggregation primitives as, uh, as, as we saw before. We can also um, split or merge the fragments together in order to uh, we redistribute and rebalance the, the data. And of course, uh, subsetting can be performed uh, both vertically and uh, horizontally on all the explicit and implicit dimensions. Uh, this is another example of data operating. In this case, we're using the expert cube where we can uh, select part of the data cube in, in order to, to, be, to be shown. This is the output that is provided by the Ophida terminal. Here we can specify the subset in order to uh, just see a part of this uh, of this data cube. Uh, as said, the feed also matches the the provenance, and uh, so through uh, some extensions on on the Ophidia terminal, we can actually see how the let's say the history of the of the data cube from the int files up to the data cube that that we are uh, inspecting for uh, to to get the the provenance. Then uh, at the um, uh, higher level of the architecture, there is the Ophelia server, which is the front end of the system, which exposes multiple interfaces for client-server interaction. And this is to allow better uh, interoperability with different clients. Uh, for example, it's for uh, web serving exploiting SOAP over HTTPS, which is the main interface, but also an o OGC uh, WPS compliant interface. The server manages also user authentication and authorization. And it takes care of managing uh, the submission and the monitoring of both single task and the workflow composed of, uh, of many tasks. Uh, the submission uh, pr uh, pr procedure has been implemented in order to be uh, flexible and extable uh, so that it will interact directly with different types of high performance computing re resource management. We have tested this currently uh, LSF and uh, and and so on. Uh, the feed the terminal as well as uh, WPS clients and Perifeed that represent clients can interact with the server. This is uh, an example of the output shown by the Ophelia terminal, which is a, a command line interface, uh, which is very similar to your, uh, to a to a Bash uh, and it provides a lot of features. As, uh, auto completion, common uh, management, environment variable definition, uh, and also common analysis, but of course tailored on the uh, Ophidia system. It translates the user request uh, in, and submits this to the to the to the server step. It can be very useful in several cases, like for executing fast and interactive testing of some data models, also for debugging and for uh, file system exploration. Uh, so thanks to the, to the defined architecture, Ophelia allows effectively to uh, support uh, different level of, of, uh, of parallelism. Uh, so we have this three level of, of parallelism support. At the, at the higher level, we can support parallelism on multiple data cubes, 
So by running the same uh, operation on multiple input data, these are called operators, uh, in which basically the same operator is applied on uh, multiple input, and then these are run concurrently by a system. This is a more uh, high throughput computing uh, case. Uh, then we have uh, a framework level parallelism which um, exploits uh, uh, the partitioning and uh, distribution scheme in order to run uh, the operators on multiple fragments in parallel. And then at the lower layer, layer we can exploit um, a parallelism at the level of the IO and analytics server which uh, exploits OpenMP to run the, uh, the pr primitives in parallel over the, the fragment uh, arrays. So to make the use of Geophilia easier in HPC environments, uh, like the, like we tested this on the SimCC zero supercomputer shown in the lower part of the slide. Uh, we have uh, the IO analytics server um, can be de 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 deployed on, the, on, the, on demand based on the user request. Uh, and this can be done through this uh, simple command. So user can specify the number of nodes that he wants to deploy. And then this will be uh, allocated uh, be before starting the analysis. And then after the analysis is concluded through the undeploy command, the resource can be released and, uh, and uh, by, the, by the rest of the, of the system. In order to make this uh, um, mechanism flexible, uh, the, um, the procedure has been implemented to, to, to support and interact with different types of uh, high performance computing scheduler. Uh, also in this case, we have test this with LSF and uh, and uh, Ensler. The server will be responsible for managing the deployment of the IO analytics service from the various user. And so thanks to this uh, multiple uh, instances of IO analytics service can be deployed by different user without uh, interfering with uh, each other. Uh, okay, so after this description of the FIDIA core aspects, I'll now move to uh, more application level features concerning uh, the support of workflows in you know, FIDIA. I'll just check quickly if there are any questions. No, I don't think so. Uh, so one of the main features that is supported by FIDIA is related to the management and execution of complex workflow composed of 100 and even 1,000 of analytical ob operators. The workflow runtime manager is one of the components of the Ophelia server and takes care of parsing and validating the workflow, as well as substituting the parameters at, at runtime. It also manages the workflow dependencies and the execution flow by scheduling the task on the resource manager in the, in the proper order. Um, so it monitors the task progress and communicates this to the client. Here we can see in the slide two example of, of, this, uh, of this workflow. This is actually the graph which is generated uh, at, uh, at runtime. Workflows are, are, are written in a JSON format. Um, and this schema um, defines a set of application level uh, semantic and syntactic rules. Uh, the JSON format has been ch chosen because it has a lower overhead with respect to, for example, uh, XML documents. And uh, it doesn't define any strict schema, so it's uh, easy to, uh, to implement one. Uh, this is uh, defined in order to model directed asynchronous graph of, uh, of, um, of tasks, uh, which means that are basically uh, graphs with, uh, where, the, where each edge has a direction and there are no cycles into the, into the, into the graph. And this uh, allows for the uh, creation of, uh, of a very complex uh, uh, task, a uh, very complex workflow of analytical tasks. The workflow manager takes care of the execution of, of the task in the proper order, and uh, it, it, it also monitors the, the status of the, of the task. Here we can see uh, the different status that each task will, will go through during the execution. Uh, just for uh, in this uh, example, we have a very, um, basic workflow composed of, of three tasks uh, in which the third one uh, de depends on the execution of the, of the first two. Uh, in this first image, we see that these are uh, color with the white color, which means that the, task, that the workflow has not been submitted yet. 
then after the submission, uh, the color of the of the circles will, will change. And so once the uh, uh, tasks have, have been uh, submitted for execution, they will be colored in the, in the, in orange. While those which are waiting which are waiting for dependencies will be uh, with this gray color. What can happen during the execution, for example? Uh, some tasks can uh, can also fail, as we can see here. Uh, this one color with this uh, in uh, in uh, red. Uh, with the workflow with the workflow uh, schema defined, there's the, the option to define uh, what uh, what uh, should we do uh, if a task fails. So um, what can what can happen is that the, the task can be simply skipped, uh, basically it is, uh, ignored, or uh, otherwise the whole workflow could uh, could uh, be uh, Aborted. Uh, once the uh, all the depend all the dependent tasks are uh, ex executed, then the execution pro proceeds on the other tasks which are scheduled. And at the end, uh, when in this uh, final image on with the three uh, circles color in green, this is the successfully completed work. So we will see uh, an example, uh, a real example in a demo in a in a few in a few slides. The, schema, uh, the JSON schema defines several uh, constructs that can be used to build and control the workflows. Uh, this slide is an extract from the FIA documentation, uh, which shows um, some of the main uh, um, constructs that can be used to define workflows. So besides dependency, specification, and error control, the workflow supports also a loop of blocks uh, of tasks, which means iteration running sequence, but also parallel independent branches that can be run concurrently. Uh, it also supports conditional workflow branches with if-else and interactive workflows, which can um, wait for an external condition to uh, occur. If you're interested, you can find additional uh, information about this in the documentation page. This is the, an example of the, of the JSON schema that is used to uh, build the, the workflow. Uh, for, so uh, for each task, we can define uh, the arguments, the name of the operator, and also the dependencies. You can see on the left part how this is translated to the to the to the graph. This uh, red parts here are related to a to a loop for, um, and we can see that when specifying parallel equal to yes means that the branch of this loop will be executed. Uh, con con concurrently on the re resources. So this basically is not a real loop, but rather uh, similar to a multi-thread uh, computation. Here we uh, can see some examples of, uh, of uh, real uh, use cases uh, that we implemented as, as, as workflows with the Ophidia schema. Uh, you can have very different shapes according to the type of processing that can be executed. I now would like to show uh, a video. Of, uh, actually, I'm going to introduce this uh, this uh, uh, real uh, case uh, case study uh, that we implemented with the uh, uh, JSON schema uh, that, that was being defined. This is an example of multi-model experiment analysis. Uh, it is the precipitation trend analysis, which is a workflow that runs on multiple uh, models, uh, exploiting hence the data from uh, from different models, and it consists of of two main uh, main main stages. Uh, in the first one, uh, which is the uh, single model precipitation trend analysis, there are uh, multiple identical sub workflows. Um, each computing the precipitation trend analysis over a single model. And for each subflow, we can see uh, there are uh, two identical branches, uh, this one here, which compute uh, the precipitation trend from uh, the historical and uh, future uh, scenario. For example, the, uh, in this case, the RCP 8.5 8, 8 uh, uh, scenario from, for this model. This basically perform the import of the data and then some subsetting. Uh, data reduction and compare uh, the the trend through a uh, linear re regression operation. After this first stage, then all the single model precipitation trend are uh, are used in the in the second stage to extract some some statistical values of uh, multiple models. Uh, 
on the output uh, computed by the by the first stage, and uh, the final uh, outcome will be a set of nested files and uh, and uh, maps. Um, I think uh, I I think I would like to mention that this is not uh, the uh, the actual workflow that is uh, that is uh, that will be represented with the uh, with the graph. Uh, Visualization. This is more a uh, higher level uh, schema that is used just to represent the uh, the main uh, points of this of this workflow. In the case of the demo that I'm going to to show, uh, the workflow has been applied on 18 models uh, coming from from different uh, inst in institutions. Uh, this slide provides a summary of the of the models that we, that we actually can. Uh, used for the execution. Here we can see a very um, brief snippet of the JSON code that has been implemented to handle this workflow. Uh, here in the right upper part of the slide, you can see uh, the workflow. Uh, once it, it has been uh, com uh, completed, you can see that there are uh, 18 uh, parts on the on the on the first on the first block of the of the workflow, each one associated to the uh, to a specific model. Then, uh, when all these 18 uh, parts are completed, this can be uh, considered together in order to compute some some statistical values that will be, then be used to output some data and uh, and uh, maps. And this is an example of the maps that are, that are going to be produced with the. Uh, some Python libraries to implement this, and in particular Matplotlib and, uh, and the Cartopy libraries. So now I would like to uh, to show uh, uh, this uh, the execution of, of this workflow to uh, to a brief uh, video. So I'll now switch uh, and sharing my my screen. Okay, let me see if I can find this. Let me click this. So now the video should uh, come up. Uh, so this that uh, we can see is the uh, example of the uh, JSON document that has been implemented for the, for this workflow. We can see that uh, for each task there are um, that there is the, the the definition of the of the arguments and the operator name. We can see that uh, we implemented. Uh, in, in this case, the parallel uh, loop that allows to run the branches in uh, in the in parallel, given the input models. In order to uh, check the progress of this uh, workflow, we have to set up a couple of uh, values in the in the terminal, and then we can uh, check the workflow with this check command. This shows the uh, this shows the uh, graph. Be, be, be before the execution of the of the workflow. Basically, this is a representation of what was written into the into the JSON document. And here we can see the two stages. The first part, which in this case is just a single branch, uh, and then the the part which is concerning the integration of all the multimodal the multiple model results. We can run this uh, by specifying the name of of the uh, workflow, which is this JSON file, and then the set of arguments that we're going to consider. So here we see the full list, the full list of uh, of uh, models that we are considering, as well as up, as a subset of the, uh, as well as some subsetting arguments concerning, for example, the time domain and the spatial domain. In this case, we are considering the full spatial domain. We can see that then this will uh, will be ex executed. We are running this on the ECAS Lab cluster at CMCC, where we have a small uh, a uh, cluster for data analysis composed of uh, 100 cores in uh, in total. Uh, it is important to mention that the execution was started from the Ophelia terminal that was installed uh, locally on a on a laptop. Uh, the left upper part of the video shows a monitoring interface based on Grafana that uh, we set up in order to check uh, the status of the resources. And in particular, uh, it shows the one minute load average. And so, as we can see, as the execution pro progresses, the number of cores being used in the in the various nodes is also uh, increasing. 
Uh, on the right part of the video, we can see the workflow graph at, at runtime with respect to the static version uh, with, that was uh, shown with the check command. Uh, we can notice that now we have 80 uh, sub -work, uh, workflows, one uh, for each input model. Uh, as the task progress, the color changes from gray, which are those waiting for dependencies, uh, to orange, which are those uh, which are running, and then uh, the wool will become uh, green, which means that they're kind of completed successfully. As the tasks are being completed, the dependent uh, task can be sub submitted for uh, execution. Uh, those uh, colored with light orange uh, are in an impending state, which means that uh, their dependencies have been completed, uh, but they're waiting for uh, re re uh, resources in order to be to be started. As we can see, there are multiple uh, tasks going in uh, in uh, in orange, uh, as we are uh, using uh, a cluster with with uh, several cores. These are being executed concurrently. Uh, so after um, the this part included, we will then move to the to the second part, which is statistical uh, analysis. And as we can see, not all tasks are completed, uh, or not not all branches are completed at the same time, and this depends on the fact that uh, we are considering a very uh, heterogeneous set of, of, uh, of data in terms of, uh, of, uh, of sizes. We have 36 data sets um, with two experiments. So basically, we are, uh, we are importing uh, the 36 files from these 18 models, uh, in particular the precipitation variable. Uh, the input to this is about 150 gigabytes, and around 25% of this is being loaded after the, uh, sub, after the subsetting. So after the first part is completed, all the single model analysis are exploited together to compute some statistical values. Uh, and in the last uh, block of the, of the ex execution, uh, five different uh, statistics are, have been comp uh, computed. Now the, it has been successfully completed. And we can see here that we have run 282 tasks, uh, starting from the, from the 36 initial data set. Uh, as said, the workflow produces an output, a set of NetCDF files with statistical values, uh, and also set of these are stored on a thread server that was being set up on the ECAS lab. Here we can see the different files of a uh, few kilobytes. This is uh, an example of output, of output map that has been uh, uh, created. So this, uh, so in this uh, workflow, we actually saw how, as how the uh, server side shipping has been actually uh, used for running this, uh, this uh, data intensive workflow. Okay, so I'll now uh, switch back to the slides. And conclude the, the session. Okay, I cannot see any more of the slides. Julian, mm -hmm. or can you? Uh, See the slide. Of course, I'm not able to share that. Oh, I, I can't see the slides. What slides yeah, are you? Are, um, actually, I'm not able to share any more the content. It's like there's the uh, loading uh, icon moving. Is, okay, is that right, right slide set? Right. Yes, I'll just have to go um, a little bit forward. Uh, fast forward to the slide that was. Let take some time. Uh, sorry for this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, somehow the application stopped.
Okay, sorry for this interruption. <laughs> For this user. And now I'd just like to introduce uh, briefly the uh, Pi over FIDA module that will be uh, used extensively during the, uh, the virtual lab tutorial. Um, so I'll yeah, just introduce some, some, some basic concepts. Uh, PyFIDA is a GPL3 uh, uh, Python module which has been uh, developed to uh, interact with the uh, Pi with the of Ophelia framework, and um, it uh, it can be used to to, uh, uh, to run all the operators that we can run from the from the from the terminal. However, with, with respect to the terminal, it provides a more uh, uh, pro programmatic interface. It handles basically uh, all the uh, client server interaction from the uh, uh, request submission to the results the serialization. It also manages uh, remove data cube objects and it can be integrated very easily with Python models and, uh, and Jupyter notebooks which will be uh, used in the in the lab. Uh, the model is uh, uh, available on the on the GitHub repository which provides also a brief documentation with some examples of, of usage. It is available from the main uh, Python channels like the Python package index or from uh, Anaconda. In the case of the VM, VM for the virtual lab, it has been uh, already installed. Uh, but you, if you would like to install it in, on your on your local node, you can just um, get it from the from the main uh, Python channels. Uh, from the point of view implementation, it defines uh, two classes, uh, providing complementary features that can be also mixed uh, together in a scientific application. Uh, so the first one is the client class uh, can be used to submit any kind of operator in a declarative query like format, uh, which is the one uh, which is similar to the format exploited into the Ophelia terminal. It represents a very flexible model since it can run operators with a single method, but with respect to the cube class, it might be uh, less less straightforward to use. The cube class uh, defines in fact the data cube type of abstraction which uh, allows uh, for the creation and management of uh, re remote cube, cube object. This um, class represents a more natural and also user-friendly way to uh, manage data cubes and perform data ana analytics. Uh, anyway, the cube class internally also use the, the client class uh, to connect to the uh, Ophelia of server. Now, thanks to the uh, PyOphelia interface, most of the, of the Ophelia features can be easily exploited from uh, Jupyter notebooks. Uh, jointly with those uh, uh, from other uh, Python modules here, we just show an, an example, and we're focusing more on how we can actually exploit the distribution, the parallelism, and the, and the uh, HPC data deployment features. Uh, we can see in, the, in, this, uh, in this line that we are actually uh, the deploying an IO and uh, an analytics server by using this uh, this uh, common, um, and then we can uh, un undeploy it, undeploy it at, at the end of the of the notebook execution in order to release the resources. In order to uh, parallelize the processing, we can specify um, as input stage by using the class con constructor the number of fragments and the uh, hosts, which are the IO analytics nodes that we want to use. And then we can define the number of cores and threads that we want to use when uh, when processing this data. And this can be actually used now the uh, data um, uh, ty data type uh, operators. We can also retrieve the data from the server side in order to use it with other Python modules on the Jupyter notebook. Uh, and I, for example, use this to create some some, some maps with uh, with uh, for example Cartopy. And this can be done with this export. Uh, array array feature, and this is one of the few features that allows to actually move data from the server side on the on the client side. Okay, so um, um, before concluding, I'll just give a brief re recap and then uh, very brief because time is is, uh, is finishing. So. Uh, so as we saw, the HPC and the analytics ecosystem differ from several points of views, but they are both fundamental for enabling scientific discoveries. Management and analysis of scientific data, uh, as in the case of climate data, pose several challenges that must be properly addressed. So novel HPDA solutions 
joining the tech niche from the two ecosystems can be actually uh, provide a great, great benefit. Uh, then also introduced the ECAS and the Ophidia HPA framework, which is one of its uh, core components, and uh, a real use case of a, of a workflow implemented with the all Ophidia features. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll put here at the end of the slide a couple of uh, a couple of um, references that have been cited during the presentation, as well as uh, some further readings if you're interested more in um, data analytics and from data analytics arguments. Um, uh, so basically with this, I conclude the talk and uh, thank you everyone for following the session. If you're interested in your feed, you can find a lot of uh, information on the website. And also if you're interested in additional details, please feel free to contact me. Now we'll see if there are any questions just to in this uh, last five minutes. Okay, so I see there's just uh, a question from uh, uh, Claude. Thank you for this talk. Uh, thank you, Claude. I have three questions. Is the Ophidia M easy to install on either a lab cluster or even a national computing center? Uh, that's a very uh, a good good question. Uh, well, basically, it, you know, since it is uh, um, um, a very uh, layered architecture, it can it can take uh, some uh, uh, let's say experience to install, uh, especially in uh, in uh, HPC cluster. Anyway, uh, we have uh, implemented a lot of features in, in order to make it uh, very and very uh, con con uh, configurable. And so we tested it. Besides at CMCC, we also run a benchmark uh, at the uh, Mare Nostrum uh, supercomputer at the uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And uh, uh, we also have an um, uh, Ansible role that allows us to uh, basically install the, the, whole, the whole system on a, uh, on a cluster type a D D deployment by just uh, specifying the installation recipes. Uh, as for example, in the, in the case of the virtual machine that we provided for the Sunday School that has been uh, created by just running the Ansible role with all the all, all of the installation, and I think it took just uh, two or two or two or three commands and uh, and uh, and the proper and the proper recipe. Uh, but of course, that was on a on a single virtual uh, virtual node, so it, it's uh, um, much easier. And then there's a second question uh, still from Claude. So from what I've seen here, it seems that Ophelia is also doing quite similar things at Pangeo M. I'm uh, right in saying that. Uh, yes, for some for some point it is uh, it is uh, uh, similar. Uh, I think that Pangeo re, uh, re relies uh, more on uh, um, Python modules like uh, uh, I think Dask or Xarray, um, and uh, so with respect to that, the Ophidia just has the Python bindings. The, the whole the whole system is implemented in uh, in C in, the, in in C code. So in order to uh, 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 also ex exploit the uh, maybe the optimization which are available on, on a high, high performance computing. Although that can also be done to a certain extent with some with some Python modules. Uh, are there any demos on the FIDA website or told to play with the right? Uh, uh, yes, you can uh, you can uh, for example uh, create uh, an account on Ecas Lab where there are a lot of notebooks. Uh, available and there you can uh, you can um, um, exploit the Ophidia features on a on a bigger cluster. Uh, we have um, uh, as, as a small cluster composed uh, of about one, 100 cores, and there they can actually uh, possible to run some some uh, uh, fun stuff with, with with respect to the virtual machine, which is more more simple in terms of resources. Uh, okay, um, are there any other questions regarding the whole presentation in general?